Good morning, Harvest Time. How are you this morning? Are you thankful or just full? All right, it's so wonderful to be with all of you. Um, and uh, I do not take this opportunity lightly to have the opportunity to share with you this Thanksgiving weekend. You know, it is uh, wonderful to take special uh, seasons to focus on some things. During Thanksgiving, we reflect on and we celebrate all the things that we are thankful for. But the truth of the matter is that thankfulness and joy are not always evident in our lives. Celebrating Thanksgiving with our loved ones and with good food, that's one thing. But being truly thankful is not easy, even on Thanksgiving. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Perhaps the most difficult thing to do in life is to thank God in difficult times. We live in a stressful and a troubled world, and sometimes it's hard for us. It is hard to find something to be thankful for. Some of you, this Thanksgiving, you had lots of good reasons to be thankful for, and you were able to celebrate. And then the rest of you, you appeared to be thankful. Come on, be honest with me. You appeared to be happy. You appeared to be thankful. But deep down below, there was something that was troubling you. Some of you have had a tough year. You've endured your share of criticism. You've lost your job. Maybe you're going through a season of change. Maybe it's a, you're, it's, you're in a season of dealing with the sickness of a loved one. Maybe you're going through some tough times financially. Uh, maybe you're in a rocky marriage Maybe there's a situation with your kids or grandkids. Maybe your business is not doing so well. Maybe you're concerned about your career, your education, the things that are bothering you. Let truth be told, some of you came in to worship this morning, uh, but with, not with a lot of joy in your heart. Like you're fine, but not really. Perhaps you're saying the same thing like the folks that were in Babylon captivity. How shall we sing the song or sing the Lord's song? Their situation was little different at the time. These people, the Israelites, were taken as captives and were brought into a foreign land. Their temple, their place of worship was destroyed. And now they were living in the midst of people who weren't believers. They didn't believe in Yahweh. Instead, they encountered beliefs and stories about the many gods of the Babylonians, which their conquerors believed in. And one day, their captors came to them and demanded a song. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. But their situation made them ask the question, how can we give thanks to God in these circumstances? How can we worship if we're in exile? How can we worship if our temple has been destroyed? How can we worship when it seems that God is not doing something for us in our situation, when he's not doing something on our behalf? Even though your situation is different, you're probably asking those same questions, similar question. How can I give thanks to God when I'm experiencing or when I'm going through this problem? You know, praising God is not always easy, especially if you come to church and, you, and you're down and the enemy reminds you that you're out of place. That's not a good place to be, right? But friends, can I tell you, regardless of what you are going through this morning, whether you're experiencing joy or pain, you have come to the right place. Amen. You have come to the right place. Amen. Amen. You have come to the right place, and I believe that the Lord is going to deal with your heart this morning. I believe he's going to put a new song in your mouth, and his goodness will cause you to give thanks to him this morning. You know, Thanksgiving is central to our lives. It is central to all that we do in our lives. The Bible has some very strong things to say concerning Thanksgiving. It says we are to give thanks to God at all. 
all times. At all times. At all times. Are you kidding me? How is that possible? When things go wrong, when things go southward, we're supposed to give thanks. When the mortgage is underwater, when illness strikes and, and pain won't go away, I'm supposed to give thanks. Paul says we are to give thanks in all situations because this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. You know, no one was more persistently thankful than Apostle Paul. No one talked about Thanksgiving like Apostle Paul. And most of the content on Thanksgiving is found in the prison epistles. Paul was a prisoner when he wrote these letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And this morning, I want to share with you from one of Paul's teachings on giving thanks to God, and I've entitled my message, Always Thankful. Can you say that with me? Always Thankful. Come on, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're reading from verses 15 through 17. Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. Colossians 3, 15, 16, and 17. It reads like this. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen? Let me give you a little background so you know what's going on in this chapter. Paul starts off this chapter by giving us a great reminder about who we are in Christ. The new man in Christ, the new woman in Christ. And he talks about how our affections and our priorities are different when we come to Christ. He says, since we've been raised with Christ, we are to focus on heavenly things and not on earthly things. He gives us a list of things. He gives us a list of things. Uh, uh, he gives us a, a put-off list, things that we are to let go. And then he also gives us the put-on list. When we are Christ, when we're in Christ, when we come to Christ, we are to put on certain things. We must clothe ourselves with certain things. And the put-off list includes a number of things like sexual immorality, impurity, evil desire, idolatry, etc. And then the put-on list which essentially has to do with the orientation of our heart, which he calls the mindset. He says we need to be governed by the things above where Christ is. Governed by things such as compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those are the outward expressions of Christian virtue that Paul directs our attention to. But along with that, he also gives us some general priorities of the new man. Some general things that he wants us to understand. He gives us three priorities of the new man and he attaches these three priorities with thanksgiving thanksgiving as the essential or the key ingredient sort of binding these priorities together the british preacher ario white once said the surest sign that you're carrying a full bucket is a wet feet that's true isn't it Whenever we attempt to carry a full bucket of, of water to, to clean the floor, to wash a car, we always get wet feet. Now, if we apply that same principle in our life, we'll realize that when our lives are full, they will overflow. When our lives are full, they will overflow. So we're going to talk about the abundance the fullness of certain things, overflow of certain things, which will lead us and cause us to give thanks. Let's take a look at these verses. First, in verse 15, we find the fullness of his peace. Everybody say it with me, the fullness of his peace. What is Paul saying in verse 15? And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and there it is, he attaches thankfulness, and be thankful. Friends, Christ offers us a special kind of peace. And he calls it my peace. 
It's his personal peace. This is a different kind of peace, you know. When he said, peace I leave with you, he was not saying that I'm going to go back and I'm going to take all the comfort with me. No, he didn't do that. He left his peace with us. When he was on earth, he was a source of comfort and you had peace in him. But that peace, when he went away, he left it with us. He said the foxes had holes and the birds of the air had nests, but the Son of Man didn't have a place to lay his head. He had no earthly estate to leave to his disciples, but he had one thing, and he bestowed it upon us, and that's his personal peace. God's peace. And that is not just the peace that we experience when there is no conflict. It's more than that. It's a sense of wholeness and well-being and completeness and totality. I read a story about a new submarine that was being tested. And as part of this test, the submarine had to be submerged uh, beneath the ocean surface for a very long period of time. When the submarine was uh, submerged for its test, a powerful storm passed through the, the, the sea. It affected a lot of ships in the area. When the submarine returned to the harbor, the captain, uh, the man who was in charge of this test, asked the captain, he asked him, how did that terrible storm affect you? The captain looked at him and said, what storm? What are you talking about? You know, the reason for this captain's surprise was that this submarine had been so far beneath the ocean's surface that it reached the area known to the sailors as the cushion of the sea. No matter what's going on, it doesn't matter if there's a terrible storm, the waters in the cushion are never stirred. Never stirred. The submarine remains safely in the cushion. You know, that's what the peace of God does to you. The peace of God is that calmness, which lies far too deep down to be reached by any external disturbance. Friends, God's peace does not focus on the absence of trouble. In fact, His peace is unrelated to your circumstances. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It is not affected by what happens on the outside. Can I tell you, you can be in the midst of great problems and you can still have peace. You can still have peace. Paul said he could be content in any circumstances and he demonstrated that he had peace when he was in jail at Philippi. Where he sang praises to his God. We worshipped God. And when an opportunity arose, he brought the Philippian jailer and his family to Christ. His peace was unaffected by his circumstances. It didn't matter what was going on. Where does one find that kind of a peace? The kind of peace that is unaffected by fear or anxiety. By uncertainty, by danger or sorrow. Well, let me remind you of the hours leading up to Christ's crucifixion. I think it's, this is amazing. The best illustration on peace in all of Scripture comes from the Lord on the night before he suffered a very painful death. He knew what he was facing, yet he still took time to comfort his disciples. And he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Friends, the peace that he gives us allows us to remain calm in the most uncertain and fearful circumstances. The peace is never, ever affected by circumstances, but it, instead it affects and even overrules them. Amen? But peace seems like an impossible reality, doesn't it? The world has been pursuing peace for a long time, but it seems as though it has been unable to find it. There's an absence of personal peace, family peace, local peace, national peace, international peace. And people are trying to, they try to orchestrate peace with marches and rallies. But you know what? Even in the midst of that, there's no peace. How many times do you hear about shootings during peace rallies? Even in the midst of a peace rally, there is no peace. There's a lot of talk about peace, but a lot of people are unable to find peace. You know why? The truth of the matter is, you can find complete peace, total peace, 
inward peace, fullness of peace only in fellowship with God. Perfect peace, perfect peace at all times can only come from God. That's it. You can't find it anywhere else. Perfect peace can, at all times can only come from God. Have you ever had one of those days when there was so much going on around you, so much going on in your head, you just wanted to scream it out. You just wanted to say, stop. You had those moments? You guys are lying. <laughs> you know, from time to time, we all experience those kinds of moments. And when we give in, we react to someone in an, uh, in an ugly way or get depressed or go to bed and try to forget about it. But what do you do in those moments when you want everything to just stop? Just stop. Well, Paul gives us a little word in verse 15 that's the key to having the fullness of peace. This is the key to this whole thing. And you missed that word, you've missed the meaning of this verse. He says, let the peace of Christ, what? Rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ, what? Rule in your hearts. Instead of giving way to these emotions that want to get the best of you, you need to allow the peace of God to rule in your heart. You need to allow the peace of God, His supernatural peace, to dominate your life, governing every emotion and situation that confronts you. Like you need to let the peace of God to have the control in all of life's circumstances. You let His peace rule. You let His peace be the referee, the umpire. That's the idea here. You let it call the shots in your difficult situation. Even though we all have difficult days, we don't have to surrender to those emotions that steal our joy. When you feel overwhelmed by problems or emotions that are hitting you from every direction, just stop for a moment and focus your heart and mind on the peace of Christ. On the peace of Christ. When you do that, this wonderful, conquering, dominating, supernatural peace will rise up from your spirit and will take control. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. You let it rule in your heart. Amen? Amen. Hours before Jesus was arrested, he spoke, to, he spoke to his disciples about the times ahead, the days they would face without his physical presence. He said, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then in a little while you'll see me again. Of course, Jesus was talking about returning back to his father and then coming back. But the disciples were confused. What do you mean a little while? Jesus gives them a response, an amazing response that they could hold on to. He said, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. Peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. When we pour out our anxieties, when we pour out our fears, when we pour out our sorrows, God pours in his peace. Amen. Amen. So what are we to do with this peace? Come on. Rule. rule. Amen. We let it rule in our hearts. Let it be your counselor. Let it decide what is right. Let it make the choices in your difficult circumstances. When you live like that, you will experience the fullness of God's peace. And not only that, you will move from thanksgiving to thanks living. Amen. <laughs> And you'll always be thankful by the goodness of God in your life. So let the peace of God rule in your hearts, as Paul says, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Thankful. What's next? In verse 16, we find the fullness of his word. Come on, say with me. The fullness of his word. What is Paul saying here? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness. There it is. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. How can we allow the word of God to dwell in us richly? How can we do that? Yeah, we must begin by reading it. Come on, it's not that complicated. We must begin by reading it. You know, people say, oh, I have a hard time understanding, you know, especially the Old Testament. It's, it's not really easy to understand. Can I tell you, the Bible is not all that difficult to understand, though there are some difficult passages. You know, Mark Twain put it in perspective when he said, most people are bothered by those passages of Scripture which they cannot understand. But for me, I've always noticed that the passages which trouble me the most are which I do understand. What happens is that when you begin to understand, you allow the sanctifying power of the Word of God to begin to shape your life. Bible is understandable. Don't make that your excuse for not reading your word. We need to be both comforted and troubled by the word of God. But here's the thing. Simply reading does not guarantee that the word of God will dwell in you richly. God's word must be meditated on under the influence of the Holy Spirit if it is to dwell richly in us. You see, it's not a question of discipline study. It's a question of your heart. Amen. Don't get carried away with, uh, you know, Bible plans. You know, year-long Bible plans, monthly Bible plans, reading plans. Those are good and wonderful. But it's a question of the heart. Ask God to help you. When the buckets of our lives are full to the brim with God's word, we cannot move forward without spilling forth in wisdom, understanding, and discernment. You know, the Christians in Colossae, whom Paul wrote these words, didn't have a, a leather-bound Bible in their hands. They didn't have a copy of the New Testament with the words of Jesus printed in red. They didn't have a Bible app. They didn't have the Internet. The Colossian Christians had less scripture in their hands than we have in ours. But whatever amount of scripture these first Christians had in their possession, they treasured and then shared with other believers. You know, one of the sad things in some churches today is that there seems to be so little teaching from the Word of God that you rarely have to open your Bible. You rarely have to even bring your Bible to church. And that's a sad reality, and that amazes me because the Word of God is so rich and so wonderful. There's so much to learn and to understand. The Apostle Paul loved the Word of God. During a difficult time in his life, he wrote to Timothy, When you come, bring the cloak I left in Troas and Carpus, as well as the scrolls, especially the parchments. He talks about two different types of documents here. Once he... Well, one he calls uh, the scrolls and the other the parchments. You know, some scholars have proposed that the parchments might have been Paul's personal copies of various scripture. Perhaps even uh, the books or the scrolls or some of his own writings, his study notes, maybe his drafts, these letters, right? Even to his final breath, Paul was a student of God's word. And it is with this mindset that in encourages the Colossian believers saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If you want the word of God to transform your life, then permit it to dwell in you richly. That's how you do it. When the word of God dwells in us richly, even the most difficult of circumstances in life can become an opportunity for praise. See, that's why Paul was able to accomplish all these wonderful things. Sometimes you wonder when you're reading about Paul and you wonder, like, how is he able to give thanks to God and do all these wonderful things? I mean, he was in jail most of the time. Like, how? Because he allowed the word of God to dwell in him richly. Richly. He looked at his life situations and an opportunity of praise. He had that mindset. How did he get there? He allowed the word of God to dwell in him richly. Friends, let, let's allow the word of God 
deep into our being, nourishing our spirit and affecting our soul, our mind, our emotion, and our will. So read your Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Make time to take in the word as food, to eat it, digest it, and even assimilate it into us by praying over it. Because when you seek the Lord in his word, when you're speaking the word, you're praising him with this word, we give the word more and more room to dwell in us richly. Have you ever stopped to consider all the words that dwell in you from a source other than Christ? There are so many voices and words to receive from everything surrounding our lives. Paul knew that. And that's why he's instructing these Christians in Colossae to reject those voices. To turn away from what these people were saying. And let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. You see, there were a group of people that were in the church or coming to church and saying, you know, Christ is not enough. There's so much more to life than Christ. Let me show you. Let me show you what's out there. You guys need to explore. But Paul writes this to the Colossian church saying, no, wait. He's all sufficient. He's more than enough. He is more than enough. Don't let the enemy ever tell you that he's not sufficient. He is more than enough. God desires intimate fellowship with us, but this fellowship must be in line with his word, done according to the terms and not what we think would be acceptable. He clearly says, keep my commandments. This is how you, what? Love me. It is from this fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, richly dwelling in his word, that the fruit of the spirit is produced in our heart for God and for others. And if you live that kind of a life, it will empower you to teach one another in all wisdom, as Paul says, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. And you will sing to God with gratitude and thanksgiving in your hearts. Amen? So we let the peace of Christ, what? Rule, Rule in our hearts. And we let the Word of God, what? Dwell in our hearts. And finally, in verse 17, we find the fullness of of his name. Come on, say with me, the fullness of his name. What is Paul saying here? And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul uses those words, word or deed, to cover the entire spectrum. You cannot say, well, there are some things in my life that are technically neither words or deeds that I perform. It is an all-inclusive option that he employs in verse 17. Whatever you do, anything, it could be anything in word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus. What's in a name? What's in a name? Well, it depends on whose name it is. Right? We serve the one whose name is above all names and his name is Jesus. Come on, praise him. Give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Prophet Isaiah tells him some important things about him. He gives us his name and his characteristics. The one who's called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Each of these descriptions give us a different aspect of the work that God wants to do in our lives. They're not simply names. His name is Wonderful. The root word, wonder, which means a sense of awe. Friends, Jesus wants to bring a sense of awe and wonder in your life. You believe that? You believe that? No longer do we have to look at the cheap substitutes that this world offers to bring fulfillment because Jesus Christ makes this life wonderful. He makes your life wonderful and beautiful. Its name is Counselor. Do you know that God Almighty wants to give you his personal counsel and direction in your life? Psalm 73, 24 says, You will give me your counsel and afterward receive me into glory. No longer do you have to be baffled by the problems we face because Christ as your counselor, you can know 
that God will reveal his will to you. His name is Mighty God. It means he has the unlimited power. Unlimited power for you as you encounter the demands of life. There are times when you're probably, you've thought to yourself and you ask the question, how can I even live this Christian life? It is tough. It is tough. But aren't you thankful that the mighty God is there to give us the strength to do what he wants us to do every day? You're still here, alive and breathing. You're still here. Aren't you thankful that our mighty God gives us the strength just in time, just in time? He's also called the everlasting father because Christ came to die on the cross and pay for our sins and rise from the dead. You have an everlasting father, one who will be with you forever. He will never forget about you. He will never forsake you. He will always be there to guide you and help you through life. His name is Prince of Peace. We live in frightening times, right? We look at our world and see so many things that have gone wrong. We need the Prince of Peace in our lives. What's in a name? All depends on whose name it is. Jesus can be your Prince of Peace. He can be your Almighty God. He can be your Counselor. He can be your everla Everlasting Father. And you can experience life to the fullest because His name is wonderful. Amen? So it is based on this name, the name of Jesus, that Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And along with that, what does he say? What does it say? Come on, do you have your Bibles? Give thanks to him. You see how he puts in Thank, thank, uh, thanksgiving at the end of every verse. He attaches thanksgiving to the priorities of the new man. How many of you are ready to give some thanks this morning? Come on, stand to your feet and give God a mighty shout of praise all over this place.